So today we're just going to do the lab section for the support vector machine. So then we want to explore certain of the, they say they will explore certain of the hyperparameters to see how those can improve the performance. So first we have to load, definitely we have to load the tidy model from the library and also the ISLR, just where you get the data. So what they did is uh, they want to create a very a fake data set, a synthetic data set where they put sets it to one and then you have this X and Y. So we will have three variables, three var like three columns and then two variables. So you have X1 and X2. So under each X, you will have about 40 observations. So if you plot it based on this synthetic data set, if you plot it, you realize that they are not exactly well separated, as in there's no way for us to just fit a line, just pass it through. Because if you just put it here, you will have like a lot of misclassifications. So what they so one way is we want to find a best. Um, so for support vector machine, we want to find a line where it best minimizes the misclassifications, but also have like a certain amount of like correct classifications. So one is let's start with they start with talking about how we can set the degree to one. So we can also set so using this degree to one. You can also set is it if you want to do a polynomial kernel, you can set the degree to two or three to see whether you will better uh, predicts the, the model will better predicts the y. So then they also set the scale to force when they're doing the set engine because you want the engine to scale the data for you so you don't have to do the transformation. Okay, so we start with uh using this uh, support vector machine underscore poly degree e to equals to one. So we have a few arguments. I was looking at this, uh, not this one, one. Uh, yeah. So support, you want to use, let's say SVM, Poly. So if this SVM poly, it has a few arguments in it. So first you want to set the engine to be kern lab. Then the cost and degree, you have the scale factor, which we will set to force later on. Then the degree is what we set as equals to one. So degree is just um, what's the polynomial degree. The cost, we will talk about the cost. So depending on the cost value, you will have a narrow margin or a large margin. Okay, back to this. So, so we set as support vector machine poly degree to one. You want to set the mode as in our mode, it will be like classification and the engine is connect with scale to force, set to force. So for the cost, if you want to add, because it was the previous argument, we can use something called the set the arguments. So if you set arguments, you can add on the additional argument without you having to modify the previous uh, specified models. So you can set cost equals to 10. Then we try to fit as in we want to predict the y. So the y because we are now looking at binary classification. So you can be either one or negative one. Okay, using this simulated data. So based on this fit, when you they have this fit time and cost sets to 10, when you set to 10 and degree equals to one, we have the number of support vectors is about 17. So if you remember, support vectors are those like points on the margin. So those are the support vectors. 
Okay, then we can visualize using the plot if you load it. So we can, when we visualize it here, you can see that, okay, we have two, um, it's a binary classification. So you have these triangles and the circles. It seems that, okay, you have some misclassifications here. Let's say the parameter is here. So you still have this like misclassifying, this circle here, which is misclassified. Then you still have this triangle over here that's misclassified. Okay, so what if now the next thing is the sign mentioned about cost? The cost will affect the uh, the what the width of your margin. So what if we instead of 10 we set our cost to be 0 0.1? Okay, fitting it with a lower cost when you have a lower cost and you realize that your number of your support vectors would have increased to 25. So when we means when we have a smaller value of cost, you have higher support vectors means now you have a larger margin. So you don't, instead of a narrow margin, when you have low cost, you have a narrow margin, but when you have, a, when you have low cost, you have larger margin. But when you have a higher cost, you have a narrow margin. Okay, that's why when you set the cost to 0 0.1 this time, your support vectors you have more because the margin is now wider. Okay. Actually, then how do we actually decide what is the appropriate number for the cost? So to in order for us to find the most appropriate value of cost that will produce the highest, the most accurate uh, support vector model. So we want to use something called a tune grid. Okay, if you use a tune grid, we still using the, um, uh, the same workflow. Okay, you use this workflow, then the, in the add model here, you set the argument, okay? Cost instead of specifying the exact constant number, you put a cost equals to Q. Then you add the formula. We use the set seed. This one is the V4 underscore CV. So this one is we doing a cross validation here. So V4 cross validation is also is our K4 cross validation. So it just helps us to split our data into a certain amount of groups, which each groups will have equal number of observations. So we call these like groups, is, we call it four. That's why it's V4 cross validation. Okay. In this V4, you have this strata. Strata is just dividing it into like the percentile, oh, sorry, the quartiles. Then V is like how many partitions that you do want. So here we set the strata, we separate it into quartiles. You base it on the Y, so we separate into quartiles. Then you have this one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine, ten. So here is we set the grid to 10. Okay, we set it into grid. Then based on this grid, we can use this tune grid. Okay, tune grid, then you use a support vector, use back here, workflow. So you put on the workflow, then you base it on the simulated data flow, okay, which is this one, which we have separated it into strata. Then the grid, okay, means you divide into 10 columns. Based on this, you can see that, okay, the accuracy actually doesn't really matter, but 0 0.825, okay, but then here improved by 0 0.025. So it seems that a range of costs, the most appropriate cost is somewhere between slightly less than two. 
So somewhere around here, it seems that this is the most appropriate cost to put to give us the mostly the highest accuracy model. Okay, then we want to use something called select best. In this select best function, we want to select based on just now the tune rest. If you have selected the tune rest, so we select here the best tuning, then we select the best one using the metric accuracy. Then based on this, this will be our best cost, which is here. Based on his best cost, then we want to finalize our workflow and we fit it into our data. Okay, then that's how we get the fit. Next one, we can they talk about the using by changing the set seed, they use a different data set. So we still generate and we want to test whether these models that we have finalized it, is it, does it produce the same result in a different data set? Okay, so we still have a different data set. Okay, then we use, look at it like support, like uh, this one the data using this model, and but then we change our data to the newer model, same data test, and we look at our confusion matrix. Based on this confusion matrix, let's look at the correct decision. So negative one, negative one, the prediction and the truth are same, you get eight. So two is only you have missed. This is the wrong decisions that we have arrived at. So when it's actually negative one, then you predicted this one, only two. So this seems from the confusion matrix, it seems that the model is actually quite accurate in predicting, uh, is quite accurate in classifying it into negative one and one. So it means it's quite a good model, okay? Here also, like when it's one, then you get one, so eight and seven. So eight and seven, those are the correct decision. So it means that we perform quite well, only seven correct, three wrong. Okay. Next one, we want to look into long linear kernel. So <clears throat> this is more difficult as in now you have somewhere like the blue dots is somewhere in the middle of like the red dots. So last week we talked about the dosage, right? So one good example is what is the appropriate dosage that for us to know it works in curing cancer, let's say. So you don't want like too less or too much. So you want somewhere in the middle. So do, using this like either polynomial kernel or either using radial kernel should be helps you to classify this into the appropriate group. So we still set seed, but this time our data, we use a new data set, sim data two. Okay, then we will try with the radial kernel. So because this is a non-linear data, we using support vector machine RBF. Uh, support version is under the PASNIP, so you have quite a similar thing where your engine is still current. Uh, then your cost, then you have this sigma and the margin. So I was looking at sigma as in this sigma represents a positive number for radial basis function. Then the margin is how many you want for the epsilon. Okay. So how they're doing, they're doing a very basic one. You fit the model using uh, this specification. Then you fit it Y. Then when you plot it, it seems that if you just look at here, when you plot it, it seems that we kind of like the model is performing quite well as you can separate it, like you, the blue dots you can see is actually separating it quite well 
you get the middle section, then you exclude the two at the peripheral side. Okay, so we still have some misclassifications, but it seems that it's, overall it's performing quite well. Although here we actually don't have exact the line, so it's a like cursive. Okay, then if we test it, then we want to test it is whether the model or the equation does it generalize to a different data set. So we just use the set seed then generate a new data set. Then from here, this new data set using this data set, and we run a confusion matrix. We feel that, okay, when the truth and the prediction is 137, then the wrong decision is about only 13. Then another one is when 43 and the wrong decision is about seven. So overall, even though we are using a different simulator data set, you still get quite an accurate result. So we want next, we want to look into this ROC curve. So ROC curve looks at two things. One is the specificity and the other one is the accuracy. So this is an example of ROC curve. So in ROC curve, like just to generalize, you want it to be very near here. Okay, so here it will be the best. So if it's like cursive like this, then this is the worst. So before we go on here, so looking at this RC curve, so we're using the new data set, okay? <laughs> this new data set, and then we run an ROC curve with the truth and the estimate. Then we produce two things, the specificity and the sensitive, sensi sensitivity <laughs> threshold. Getting a quick visualization using this one, it says that, okay, it's still quite near towards here. So, but this is just based on just like visual, looking at it visually, it seems that the model is performing quite well, the RC curve is doing well. But then we want a specific matrix, right? So one way is to calculate the area under the curve. You want it to be as near to one, as, as close to one as possible. So calculating the area under the curve, we can't, one of it using this one. So you use ROCAUG, ROCAUC. Calculating the area under the curve, it seems that the area under the curve is 0 0.925. So about 92.5%, which is quite a good fit. Next is we want to apply to a real data. So we're using a current data set. So to explain what is in that data set, first, the data set, it contains a uh, 2000, so well, I believe, wait, uh, 2000, yeah, 2000 old plus gene expression measurements. And we want to correspond to four types of cell tumors. So basically, it's just you want to use to determine which gene expression actually predicts the, which type of cancer. So we, we actually have four types of cancers, cancerous tumor. So you want to see which of these genes are specific to each cancer. So in the data set, you actually have actually the train and the test one. So the train one actually contains 2,308 gene expressions and that's for 63 subjects. So they actually divided the training data set and the test data sets. So in total, you we actually had 83 subjects, means 83 participants, and each participant had about 2,308 gene expression. So it's quite a huge data set for it. Then back. So first, they create two tables, means two tables. So one is for the training, 
and one is for the testing data. So they create x y train and x train. Okay, then here y equals to y train, then here will x train. Then here y equals to y test, give will x test. So here one is the training data set, one is the testing one. Wait up. Training data set has about 63. Yeah. Training data set will have about 63. And this is 2308 gene expression. Then um, testing one will have about 20. Okay. Um, so because we, this is a huge data set, then they say you want to use something the first one is when they try to fit, they set the cost into 10 first for now. Okay, then we're using a linear spec. Then we fit it. And then we have the confusion matrix. <sighs> then let's look at this confusion matrix. Because instead of just having a binary, uh, binary classifications, now we have, we want to identify we have four classifications. So when it comes to four classifications, so when it's one, one is eight, eight. So you don't have misclassified. Then you have this 23, there's no misclassified. Then three is 12, 12, then here 20. Okay. This is a perfect confusion matrix. There's no misclassification at all. And this is really not realistic as if you do not have any misclassifications, okay? But what we can do is they say, okay, because we are getting this type of result because they say the hyperplanes were able to fully separate the classes, okay? And we actually don't, this is based on the training data set. Obviously it looks very nice. So we want to see whether it generalized to the testing data set. So if we test it on the testing data set this time, let's look at our confusion matrix. Our testing data set has about 20 participants. It's not a lot. So, here is when one one is you have three, then two two is six, here four and five. So we only have misclassification at here two. Then the rest we have zero. So only like two misclassification out of 20, which is almost perfect. <laughs> it's almost perfect, so it has a few misclassifications, but it's not doing too bad. So overall, the model is doing quite well if we use a radio curve. Oh no, this is falling off it. So then that's all. So I was also thinking because the lab is quite short. So I was thinking that we can talk more about this support vector like because from last week, I'm not sure how well you all understand this. Like, do you guys have any questions regarding the support vector, especially the support vector machines or the radial kernels or the polynomial kernels? Is everyone, no one has a questions regarding the support vector? I find like the support vector is like quite nice as in like it's an extension from logistic regression, I think. Mm, then I never used it before, so I'm like not familiar with it. But overall, I feel it's quite easy and memorable. To use. <laughs> uh, yeah, because there are so many types of kernels, like, how do I know which one to use? Like, 
like the first example, like the poly mm-hmm. was used, and then the second example, the radio was used, and then the third one was the linear one. So how do they manage to get these three in the first place? Like, is it because they test all three and then they just pick the best one or something? Yeah, actually, yeah. I think when I was going through, I was like confused about how you actually selected the best kernel to use, right? One of it is like, it seems that they would do something like the plotting. You see, like usually you just plot it first, right? You have a training data set and a test data set. So you plot it and you roughly would know like which kind of uh, kernel to use. Then for the polynomials, because polynomials, you can go up very high, right? Let's say two, you can do the quadratic one, two, three, four, or five. The degree can go up very high. So what they did is usually you have to select the best degree, like how you select the cost. You select the best degree using the cost validation method. So you means you let them to compute. You run a certain function, then you let it compute, then you find the best degree, the one that give you the highest accuracy. So for support vector machine, what I realized is you really need to use it with cross-validation. Means you use cross-validation to predict the best model for you, then only you decide on the degree or the cost or anything. So you definitely, if you're not sure whether to use polynomial or radial kernel, let's say you have these two common one, right? You run both, then you see which one is has a better prediction rate. And that one you look based on the confusion matrix. So we still need to separate it into training and test data set. Does that help? <laughs> uh, yeah, in terms of plotting, I guess the example, because there's only two variables mm. so maybe it's easier to see which one to use because you plot there you can see the separation you can see whether it's sufficient to do by line or this kind or circle or something else I, yeah. I find it hard to mm. I find it hard to visualize if 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 you only have like two variables right then it's easier yeah. to visualize. But then let's say we have like four, right? Then it gets harder to visualize. Yeah, I wonder if there's any like R packages that can help to visualize this in R or to visualize this SVM results besides the collab plot. <laughs> Yeah, you see because, like, uh, when they do it, the Khan data set, they did not visualize anymore. <laughs> yeah, because they couldn't do the visualize. I think they couldn't do the visualization for the data set when they have like four groups that they need to classify into. Okay. I was also looking at like new, like is there a way for us to like understand support vector visualization? <laughs> I couldn't find I couldn't find like online tutorials that talk about support yeah, vectors. Because like, usually like, it's limited by the R package that was used mm-hmm. like the proxy. So maybe collab uh not so much option for visualization. I I found one by the Julia Sage one, but she's um I think in this tutorial that I found, it's like it's talking about um the rent the forest one, the random forest and the support vector. Towards the end, you will see they talk about two types of model. One is like the random forest one and the classification. Another one is using the radial kernel. It's still the same because it's still using tidy model. But you can see like there are two types of models. So she actually evaluated two models. Okay, then compare the matrices, as in she compares whether she calculates the uh, accuracy. 
So it means she ran multiple models and calculated all the accuracy and decided on the best model, it seems. Yeah, then she also looked at the ROC curve. I think ROC curve is one way that you can use to decide which model best predict. As in, you want something with a higher value. I think that's a good point. Then what else that I found? Um, I did not see any. Yeah. If you guys found another tutorial for support vector, then y'all can post in the chat. But I did not see any. Like the Kern lab, there's a package called Kern lab. Like, but here is like in tidy models. So the Kern lab, I think, is not using tidy models for these tutorials. That's one that I don't know whether you have. Jeremy, do you see this? The one that they have it, the Kern lab one. Uh, well, uh, the tiny one was just using Kern lab as a proxy. Yeah, but this one is like, they just load the Kern lab, I think. So if you Google Kern lab, it was like so cool. Yeah, because <laughs> when you do the that. feed extract engine, you already mm. get the Kern lab object in the first place. So any yeah. function that. In the workflow, right? Yeah. So you might want to check that out. Mm. So then I'm not sure because I've never but have you used this before, like the turn map like tidy models in tiny models? Uh no. I only started to use all these models in this book club. My workplace doesn't use them <laughs> for the from for my case. Yeah, I do I work a lot more with like regression problems rather than like this kind of classification. Yeah, so it's interesting. <laughs> Nile, do you have anything else that you want to share with us, like in the chat? <laughs> yeah, so if nothing, so let's just end here today. So next week, we will go into deep learning. So I will not have time to, I will check whether our presenter is able to present next week, if it's, if it's not too busy. <laughs> so I'll check then, hopefully, he's able to present that we will not delay the meeting. So if there's nothing else, then let's just meet again next week. Let's end here, then we'll meet next week. If there's anything urgent, I just post it in the Slack group. Okay. All right, bye. Bye-bye. Okay,